Good morning. Are we expected and excited to hear the word of God this morning? I am, and I know what's coming. <laughs> Lord, we just pray this morning that you'll just bless this word. Holy Spirit, that anything that's from me will just drop to the ground, but anything from you will go out, will penetrate hearts and lives, that we'll leave change this morning. We just pray that you'll have your way this morning. In yeah. Jesus' name, amen. So this morning, continuing the Whisper series, I'm going to be looking at Samuel. If you read 1 Samuel 1, you can read the account of Hannah, Samuel's mother, who was originally unable to have children, and her battle with prayer and faith, which eventually led to her becoming pregnant with Samuel. If you heard my This Is My Story from back in the summer, you know the similarities that I had with Hannah, not just in namesake, um, but actually how some of those verses were instrumental in my story and that the Lord undertook for us as he did with Hannah by blessing us with a child. So this book is already special to me. If you read on in chapter 1, you discover that once Hannah has weaned Samuel, she then takes him to the temple and presents him to the priest Eli. And Samuel was to spend the rest of his life in service in the temple. So here is Hannah handing over her firstborn miracle child to the Lord when he was only about four years of age. I'm not sure I could have gone through with that. Maybe when the girls were age two and having their tantrums and asserting their authority, they probably could have cheerfully handed them over then. But you know, by the time they're four, they can talk and communicate. They tend to calm down a bit, don't they? So I like to have them around. I'm only joking, Sophie and Hope, if you ever watch this back. Anyway, Hannah was uh, faithful in her promise and commitment to the Lord, and she left Samuel at the temple. And then it's then in chapter 3 that I want to pick up the story and look at this morning. If you've spent any time in Sunday school as a child, I'm sure you would have taught this passage, but let's read it with new eyes, new perspective this morning, and hear what the Lord wants to say to us through it. So I'm going to read some verses from chapter 3. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me? But Eli said, I did not call, go back and lie down. So he went and lay down. Again, the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me? My son, Eli said, I did not call, go back and lie down. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. A third time the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, go and lie down. If he calls you, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then the Lord said, speak, for your servant is listening. And down to verse 19. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. So we read that the voice of the Lord was not heard often in that time. The heart of the people of Israel was quite hard. The priests of that time, many were corrupt and of disrepute. In fact, if you go back to chapter 2, you can read that Eli's own sons were of this kind. Verse 13 says, Eli's sons were scoundrels. They had no regard for the Lord. Samuel wouldn't have been used to hearing the Lord's voice or have witnessed others hearing from him. Maybe you've not been used to hearing the Lord's voice yourself, but it's never too late to start, and it can bring a wonderful new depth to your relationship. In this series, although we're looking at certain characters in the Bible, as has been said in previous weeks, hearing from the Lord is not just for them, but for every single one of us today who would call ourselves a child of God. It's not just for the pastors or the leaders of the church or those in full-time ministry, those with a theology degree or those that have been saved a certain number of years. It's for all. 
I think it was Lois who, who quoted John Tenmar. It says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. It also says, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. That's for anyone in the fold. Jeremiah 33 says, call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. The Holy Spirit living within us is key to knowing that voice. John 16, 13 says, But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. You know, he knows who you marry. He knows your career choices. He knows where you should live. He knows how to use your gifts and fulfill your potential on earth. And he's not trying to keep it a secret from you, like some impossible puzzle for you to work out and work your way through. At the right time, as he sees fit, he will lead you and he'll speak to you. So we need to be able to tune into his voice. When Samuel is experiencing this first encounter with the Lord, he's thought to be about 11 years of age. You know, we talk a lot about children being the future of, of the church, and I get and I agree with that. However, I actually think they're part of the church now also, and can play a part in spiritual aspects just as much as the next person. When our church we were part of locally closed down, we were transferred to a church in Caerphilly, which we attended for a while. And the pastor, Roger, one Sunday morning, called the children forward prior to them going out to Sunday school. Hope had just turned four years of age. So Roger scooped her up in his lap as she put her hands up, and the other children sat on the stage around him. He asked the children what taking communion was about, and some of the children put their hands up, including Hope. I started to get a bit uneasy in my seat. <laughs> Because if you've ever spoken to Hope, you'll know she's quite a chatterbox. Confirmed as I was listening to her with a hairdresser the other month. And you'll know our family history in any time at all. So inevitably, Roger said, yes, Hope. And uh, she, she took the mic and looking out to the crowd, she said, God loves you very much. And Roger said, yes, he does. And just as Hope came up into my lap, our father wants you to come near to him so he can take you in his arms. Roger said, I'm going to continue now, Hope. Is that okay? And she went, hmm, and took the mic back again. And she said, um, you don't need to be scared. And she went on about darkness and how God will look after you. Now, although Hope had a vocabulary older than her years, I knew this wasn't her typical language in what she was saying, and I had a feeling that it was for someone else. Roger, thankfully, also picked up that maybe the Lord was in this and elaborated on her word. After that, we took communion and the children went out. And after the service, um, as we were going home, Matthew was driving home, I just had this impression in my mind that someone had come to the Lord through Hope's words. And it nagged at me all the way home. I hadn't seen anyone new there, and I thought, well, if not, then hopefully it just blessed someone anyway. When we got home, started dinner, and the telephone rang, and it was Roger. And he said, I just wanted to let you know that today we had a lady in the service who would call herself a witch. She was into demonic worship. She'd been battling coming to church for weeks, feeling that she needed to come to this place. She came in late. She sat in the back. She was feeling very uncomfortable. And then Hope said, God loves you. It pierced her heart, and she felt the Lord was talking straight to her. The lady recognized that it was a higher power than the ones that she'd been in contact with. And she then started panicking, thinking of all she was involved in. Would this God be mad with her? Would she be punished? She thought she ought to leave. But then Hope started talking about not being scared, and it's okay, and so on. After the service, she'd gone up to the pastor and she told him all this. And so there and then, she gave her life to the Lord. A few weeks later, they were having a baptismal service. And the lady asked Hope to be a towel holder for when she came out the water. You know, it was so incredible to witness. In fact, she came up to us this morning. But she hasn't said anything like this for years. And she just sat next to me and Matthew and said, I feel the Holy Spirit is saying this this morning. Okay. <laughs> we'll see if that happens. 
But, you know, maybe some of us need to be more childlike in our faith and our confidence. Yeah. So Samuel hears his voice and, of course, thinks Eli is calling him and goes to him. After the third time, Eli catches on that it's the Lord and instructs Samuel on how to respond. Maybe you've been used to a parent, grandparent or partner doing the listening for you and telling you what the Lord is saying. Maybe it's a challenge for you this morning to start listening for yourself. Eli advises Samuel on who the voice is and how to respond. Oh, it's so good to learn from people who are wise and mature in the Lord, those experienced in hearing from him. Maybe someone you can practice with who will encourage you. As we all may feel insecure and question ourselves when we start off, I still do now. I need constant reassurance from the Lord through people that it was correct. So Samuel returns to bed and waits for the Lord to call him again. Oh, isn't it amazing that although the Lord has already called Samuel three times, he hasn't given up calling or thought, oh, I'm just going to move on to someone else who can hear me. The Lord is so patient with us. I also love how the Lord here is personally calling Samuel by name. He knows your name. The God who created the universe knows your name. Jesus, who came to earth 2,000 years ago, and walked with the disciples, he knows your name. Some people might think, well, that's fine for everyone else if the Lord wants to talk to them, but I've done so much wrong. If there was a ward for sinning, I'd win it. The Lord wouldn't want to talk to me. Well, I read a Facebook post a few years ago, and as I was preparing my notes for today, I, I found it, and it says, the devil knows your name, but calls you by your sin. God knows your sin, he calls you by your name. The Lord forgives and forgets your sins and is still wanting that intimate relationship with you personally. He's calling your name. So what can we learn from Samuel and how he responds to the Lord? He says, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. There are some great things that we can take away from that. Firstly, we need to know how to position ourselves, both physically and spiritually. Samuel was in a quiet place alone. In fact, in verse 3, he says he was where the ark of God was. We need to position ourselves where the Lord is. Now, obviously, the Lord is always with us. But there's something about spending time getting yourself into his presence, reading the Bible, listening to worship, praising him in song and in words, you're then creating an environment for the Lord to be welcome. It's one of the reasons why in church we have the worship before the word, so we can take our mind off of our circumstances and all that's going on and focus on him, give him our all so that, so that we can position ourselves and be prepared to, to hear the sermon which the Lord can speak to you through. So to position yourself, you may need a quiet space where you can go and spend time with the Lord, time away from the hubbub of daily life, time away from social media and everything else that's trying to vie for our attention. There's a story about a farmer who discovered that he'd lost his watch in his barn. It was no ordinary watch because it was a family heirloom and it had great uh, sentimental value for him. After searching high and low in the hay for a long while, he gave up. He enlisted a group of children who liked to play outside the barn. He promised them that the person who found it would be rewarded. Hearing this, the children hurried inside, inside the barn and went through and around the entire stack of hay but couldn't find the watch. Just when the far farmer was about to um, give up looking for the watch, a little boy came up to him and said, can I be given another chance? The farmer looked at him and thought, why not? So the farmer sent the little boy back into the barn. After a while, the little boy came out with the watch in his hand. The farmer was both happy and surprised, and he asked the boy how he'd succeeded where he and the rest had failed. The boy replied, I did nothing but sit on the ground and listen. In the silence, I heard the ticking of the watch and just looked for it in that direction. To hear the whisper... We need to be in an environment that allows us to hear the whisper. For some people, that might be in a car on the way back and forth to work. For some, it might be physically leaving their house and walking in nature. Whatever that might be for you, take that time out in that quiet space 
and position yourself to allow the Lord to speak to you. Secondly, we need to have the right attitude. Hearing from the Lord is a privilege. He is a holy God and we must never take it for granted. We mustn't get angry or frustrated if we're not hearing what we want to hear or when we want to hear it. Samuel referred to himself as a servant and it's with that humble attitude that we come before the Lord. Oh, don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about having to crawl around on our knees for ages to be worthy enough or any other religious ritual. ritual. We are made worthy through Jesus Christ and our acceptance of his finished work on the cross. We are his children and a part of his royal family. But you know, even when you look at the British royal family, you can read and watch about how the family approached the Queen. Even her children and grandchildren show the appropriate level of respect throughout their interaction with her. And I get the impression that it's not out of fear or diligent duty, but out of love for her and appreciation of who she is and her authority. And that is what I mean about our servant attitude when we approach our king. Howard spoke from Joshua 5, and when Joshua hears the voice of the Lord, he responds, What message does my Lord have for his servant? In the New Testament, many authors refer to themselves in this way. In Romans 1, Paul refers to himself from the outset as Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. James in James 1, Peter in 2 Peter 1, Jude in his book, and John in Revelation 1. And then, of course, if you were in house groups for the last DNA session, you'll have heard about the greatest example of all of a servant attitude. And that was Jesus Christ himself when he came to earth. In John 13, 15 to 17, Jesus says, I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. So we position ourselves correctly and then come into his presence with the correct attitude. Thirdly, Samuel says he is listening and then waits. I wonder if anyone else is like me sometimes and that I say, I'm listening for you, Lord, and I wait a few seconds, and then I start thinking about what I've got to do that day, what I need to cook for tea, where I need to take the girls, and before I know it, my mind has gone to some other place altogether. Or I'm saying, I'm listening, Lord. Wait. Wait a whole of a minute. And then go, okay, so what with my list of what I need you to do for me, Lord? Anyone else or just me? Just me? Okay. <laughs> if you were in a friendship or a relationship with someone and you asked them how they were, but then start stalking straight away before they could get a word in, that relationship might not last too long. If it's all one-sided, then it's not going to be great for the other person. I know in my household, if I speak and a certain someone is hearing but not actually listening, and I'm not naming any names here, <laughs> but then not only does it get frustrating, I may wonder what my value and worth is to them, but also, actually, sometimes important information is not getting passed on. I have asked permission for this today. <laughs> Which can lead to things not working properly in the household, such as the oven not being put on, so no tea is ready, or the children not being picked up on time. That only happened once, and we can laugh about it now. But why do couples with family around them go on date nights or out for walks together, or, and this is a bit more rare, have a night away together? We're with each other every day. We talk to each other every day. Well, we recognize that we need to take that time to step away from our situations, from where other voices are speaking over us or are competing for our attention. And to be in a place where we can actually listen to each other, where we can talk and know that the other person is truly listening to us. It helps that relationship to thrive. And because it's an important relationship, we want to make time for it. It's a two-way street, speaking and listening. Waiting is not our norm in a society nowadays, is it? In fact, we invent more and more things. It means we don't have to wait. Microwaves for instant meals, next day delivery for shopping. We have in 24-hour shops so we can go and get that item straight away. When I was young, I thought I'd never say that, but... When I was young, we would wait for a film to be released and we would go to the cinema and watch it. Then we'd have to wait a whole year for it to go onto VHS so we could go to the video shop and hire it. 
And then for it to come on TV, whew, you're talking a good three years later. Now it's pretty much onto a streaming service. I'm not saying that these things are wrong and that we should go backwards. But I am pointing out that we're just not used to waiting any longer. Listening is an action and waiting is a discipline. I wrote that myself, I like that. Should I say it again? <laughs> listening is an action and waiting is a discipline. And as we practice listening and waiting on the Lord, maybe starting off for a few minutes and building it up, we will get better as we tune into his voice. So we position ourselves, we come with the correct attitude, and then we wait and listen. So how do we hear from the Lord today? Well, you've heard mention of some ways over the past weeks of people have spoken. First and foremost, I would say the Bible is the key way the Lord speaks to us. Of course, he can't speak to you if you don't open it, so maybe some of us need to start there. Some of you may have experienced it, though, when you read a verse many times before, but one day, just when you need it, that verse will almost jump off the page at you. Someone in church mentioned a few weeks ago to me about how they were asking the Lord about a situation to do with their work. And that morning as they read their Bible app, the verse of the day before them spoke so clearly to them about what they'd asked for direction on. The Bible is the living word. It's active. It's speaking to us today. The Holy Spirit in us means that all precepts of scripture have a newness for us today. The Holy Spirit is, of course, God living on the inside of us, as I said earlier. He communicates the word and the will of the Father to us. So how else does the Lord speak to his people? Well, some people experience a voice, maybe not so much an audible voice, but like an inner voice speaking to them. For some, they have dreams, either in their sleep at night or, or daydreams. Some have visions. As the prophet Joel prophesied, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will have visions. Your old men will dream dreams. I tend to see a, a picture or an image in my mind and then words explaining what that picture is. Or sometimes I could be reading something or see something and the Holy Spirit will stir within me, telling me it's for me. When I was pregnant with hope, there was a time period where the Lord kept speaking to me over and over. He'd already spoken to us so clearly about giving us this miracle baby. And uh, now, when we were planning her name, he started talking again. I had chosen a name, and I was happy with it. However, the Lord had other plans. So I began to get a sense of a girl's name, which you now know as hope. Although I wasn't really on board with the name at the time, because it was a bit unusual, and I just felt she was going to stand out with a name like that. So I asked for confirmation, and if I ever. Everywhere I turned, there was the name, Hope. A magazine came through the door, Hope. A TV program, all about hope. Now, to a certain extent, you can believe that if you read and watch and listen to Christian programs or Christian things, then the word hope is going to come up a lot. But this wasn't just from Christian circles. I read at night, and a fictional book that I picked up and started reading, when I opened it up, the main character was called Hope, which was really unusual nine years ago. It literally got quite comical how I was being told over and over again. So did I accept it? No. I asked Matthew to pray into it and see if he heard anything to see if it was right. So it came to one night, Matthew was reading our daily reading, and it was all about if you've been waiting for the Lord to bring you something you've desired into your life, and it's been painful and hard waiting for it. And in the end, the last line finished with something like this, and the Lord shall give you hope. We laughed, and Matthew said, I think the Lord's made it pretty clear he'd like us to call our baby Hope. I said, yeah, it does seem that everything we read or watch has got hope in, in big letters. But maybe we can just ask for one final sign, another confirmation. Remember what I said earlier about the Lord being patient? I was trying to hold on to a different name. So we prayed and asked the Lord to confirm it again. The next day was a Saturday and my parents were, my mum and stepdad were coming over and we were going to Abergavenny. We walked into the castle grounds and it was about this time of year so it was surprising that it, you know, it hadn't rained or there was, wasn't dew over everything. 
The castle is usually very well maintained, but obviously the night before, some kids must have been out with chalks, as there were pictures and writing all over the castle remains. As we walked past one gigantic rock, Sophie wanted to climb up on it, so Matthew went to help her and then called me over to show me something he'd noticed. As I started walking towards them, I stopped and gasped because as Matthew was pointing out, written across this huge rock was the word hope. This is the photo that Matthew took that day. I froze. I couldn't believe it. I said, Lord, I hear you. What I would say is the Lord can speak to us however he wants. He's God. If you do hear a word, though, I would weigh it carefully. It must align with the word of God, especially if you have a word for someone else. But you could be instrumental in confirming something to someone else. I remember hearing about a girl who was sat in her car at a petrol station forecourt, well, this was America, so a gas station, debating whether she was hearing from the Lord or actually going crazy. She felt the Lord was telling her to go into the shop and do a handstand by the pop machine. Now, I have to say, many of us might struggle with hearing something like that, not only due to embarrassment, but I genuinely could not have physically carried out that instruction. However, she went in, braver than me. She waited there until the shop was empty, and when she thought the checkout system was looking away, she quickly did a handstand and went to leave. And just as she was getting to the door, the cashier said, wait, did you just do a handstand by the pop machine? Uh-oh, caught. Yes, I did, she replied, going bright red with embarrassment. The cashier was overcome with emotion and explained that not long before she cried out to God, if you're real, then send someone to do a handstand by the pop machine. <laughs> Imagine the shock and awe. Now, I'm not saying the Lord works like that often. Few, we might think. But he may well be wanting you to make a big difference in someone else's life. I'm just going to go off script slightly here because I've been at a conference the last few days and I really, I wasn't going to share this, but people said to me this morning, just say what the Holy Spirit is saying. So I am. I was listening to um, Glyn Barrett and Neil Smith from Planet Shakers and Glyn said, I was talking about do it again. And he was talking about just an, enough faith. And then Neil stood up from Planet Shakers. He's from Australia. He doesn't know Wales, know us, but he started speaking revival over Wales again. And what neither of them would know is that when we went to the AOG Leaders Conference this year, those two things were said together, do it again, revival in Wales. And I've been praying for that for a long time, but you know, as I pray into it, I don't think that it will be one man visiting a town and praying and revival breaking out. I believe this time it will be different. I believe that it will be the body of Christ rising up. And that each of us doing the ordinary will be performing the extraordinary as we listen to God. You know, they told stories. Glyn told about a boy in a supermarket who felt challenged to call forward on a tannoy someone with a, with a claw hand and pray for him. And he got healed. Neil's daughter was 19. She wasn't in ministry. She did the children's church. She prayed for someone and saw an eye socket be reformed. If you read Scattered Servants that Gareth spoke to us about, you will see people just go into the coffee shop doing their ordinary life because they're listening to the Lord. They are making a difference. They are seeing things happening. And I'm excited for that. I want to be part of that. That's why I want to listen to the Lord. Let's find where I am now. Sorry. <laughs> so one afternoon when I was praying for my best friend, I suddenly had this word come to my mind that she was going to meet her husband that week. I was like, what? She's not even dating anyone. And my whole body was goosebumps and my heart was beating rapidly. And I was sure that it was a sign from the Lord. So I rushed to grab paper and pen and scribbled it down, the date and the message. As an aside, it's good to write down when the Lord speaks to you. Not just to remind you at the time, but also to look back over as it can stir faith and encouragement, particularly if you're going through a quiet period. Anyway, two weeks later, my friend came to visit us. And as we chatted, she revealed about how she'd gone to a Christian speed dating event. She hadn't wanted to go because it was a work night and a fair distance from her home, but a friend was keen to go and she felt she ought to go with her. She got on with one chap there and they'd arranged a date. Well, you can imagine my insides at that time as I asked when it was. Turns out it was actually the same week as I had received the message. I was so excited. 
Of course, the other thing about having a word from the Lord for someone is, yes, knowing it's from the Lord and weighing it up with the word, aligning it with scripture and the character of God and praying about it, but also knowing the right time to give it. As humans, we can all make mistakes, and I'm thankful there's always God's grace there. But I have to say, sometimes I didn't respond to what the Lord had told me, whether that was out of fear or out of sheer disobedience, as Rob brought to us last week with Jonah. When I've done that, I'm sorry about it, and I try to remember that feeling of sadness, not to beat myself up with, but so that I have more courage for next time. Thankfully, that wasn't the case here, but I did keep it to myself just then. You know, Samuel's first words from the Lord were pretty heavy going, and I wouldn't have wanted to swap with him. In the morning, when Eli asked what the Lord had said to him, he may have been thinking, can I run away? Or maybe he could delay it or sugarcoat it a bit. He may have thought, do I really have to tell the man that I look up to that because of his son's blasphemy of the Lord and him failing to restrain them, that the house of Eli would never be right with the Lord again? Later on, we read that God cut off that line from serving at the altar forever. But Eli told Samuel to give it to him straight. What Samuel probably didn't know was that Eli had already received a word from the Lord about this matter. So he was actually, it was another confirmation for Eli. Samuel bravely trusted what he'd heard and told Eli everything as it was told to him. You know, I could have told my friend that day what the Lord had said to me, but it would have been the wrong time. It would have led to pressure on her and the guy she was meeting up with. But at the right time, I shared what the Lord had said, and it was a confirmation to both of them. They're now married with a little girl. If someone gives you a word, we're taught in the Bible in Thessalonians to test the word. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Because of his obedience, we read, the Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. I'm going to ask the band to, to come back up now. Samuel went on to become the leader of Israel. And when the people eventually demanded a king, it was he who anointed Saul. And when Saul messed up, he bravely anointed an unlikely choice for the next king, youngest son and shepherd boy, David. He certainly needed to be uh, confident he'd heard from the Lord on that one. Samuel was, as well as being a seer, a prophet, was a revered leader. Chapter 25 says, upon his death, all of Israel assembled and mourned for him. He was the final judge, and he had been known to be honest and fair, a great intercessor. He was a great man of prayer. Someone wrote that Samuel responded to God's call and revived his generation and influenced others to respond to prophetic ministry. You know, he encouraged Israel to turn away from idolatry and serve God alone. Imagine what you can do when you're listening and acting upon the voice of the Lord. Can I ask us all to stand if you're able to? And I'm going to pray. Can I ask you whether you're a person who hears regularly from the Lord or has never heard from the Lord before, if you want to hear the Lord speak to you, maybe about a certain situation, maybe for direction or guidance, maybe to be able to speak into someone else's life, whatever it may be, if you want to hear from the Lord, can I ask you as a sign of faith this morning, as stepping out, putting faith in action, would you say to the Lord right where you are, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. Father God, you say we have not because we ask not. Oh Lord, this morning we're asking, as your children, we're coming before our Holy Father and we're saying, speak to us, Lord. someone who's been struggling with a hearing problem, maybe an infection, an ear problem, I don't know, and you've been praying to the Lord about it, I release your healing to you this morning. Receive it and thank Jesus. For those of us who want to hear spiritually, Father God, open our ears to the things of you. 
I release pictures to people, visions to people, dreams to people. I pray that in quiet times this week, scripture will leap off the page to them. I release creativity to the worship team to hear a new song from the Lord. Holy Spirit, I pray that we will hear you so in our ordinary, in the natural, we can be performing the supernatural. That we will understand the power and authority that you've given us. And as we hear your voice, we will have the confidence to go out and do as you ask of us. Even this very week, Lord, in Jesus' name.